Good morning, everybody. I don't know about you, but I would love to see Z on a dirt bike. Okay, that would be a lot of fun. All right. <laughs> That's right. Well, my name is Brian Mosley. I serve, I serve as the lead pastor here at the Springs, and I'm really excited that you all are here. Are you ready to get into the Word for a little while? Okay. Today we're continuing a uh, teaching series. We're actually in week number five. Uh, we're talking through the book of Ephesians, okay, which is not actually a book. It's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote at about uh, the year 60. AD. And this letter is filled with all kinds of wonderful theological truth that, that was honestly, it was powerful back for the early church. It's been powerful uh, teaching throughout the centuries for the church. And, and I just want to tell you this, it's powerful today. It's powerful for you and for me to understand the message that God, through the Holy Spirit, wrote through the pen of Paul and brought to us here today through the book of Ephesians. So I want to start today with just asking you a question. Um, some of you may, may be new to the whole church idea, new to Jesus, new to Scripture, new to the Bible, and that's great. We're super glad that you're here. But what, what the question is I want to present to you now is, when you hear the word church, what comes to your mind? Okay, think about that. When you hear the word church, what do you think about? You think some people think about a, a building, right? Let's go to church, okay? When you hear the word church, what else? Some other people might think about, you know, a religious service. Some people might think about uh, a place to go for funerals, weddings, uh, Christmas, Easter. I call those people creasters, right? I, I used to be a creaster Christian where, where I would just show up on Easter and Christmas. Um, but some people think about church as boring, outdated, irrelevant to my everyday life. Um, a place where they just want my money. Hello. A place where hypocrites gather on Sunday mornings, right? Right? So let me just tell you this, um, just, just for all you new people, this may not come as a shock to you, but we're not a perfect church, okay? I'm not, I'm not a perfect pastor. Now, now, I know that's a shock, okay? But I'm, I'm far from perfect, and guess what? We don't have it all together here, okay? We, we want to be real, uh, but we, we all struggle. We all have issues, and, and, pro, and we will probably unintentionally let you down from time to time because we're human. But we're glad that you're here. We're glad that you're here and we're glad because we're all works in progress. God's working on us all, developing us, teaching us, growing us, stretching us in our relationship with Him, in our relationship with each other. So... I just want you to know from the, from the start here, we're a church full of broken, imperfect people with every kind of story imaginable, but I want you to know you're welcome here. Amen? amen? Yeah. Come on, all, the, all our regulars, say a good amen to that. Yeah. Yeah, okay, you're welcome here. So when you think about church, guys, what, what's important is this. Let's think about what church is not, first of all, okay? If you're taking notes, jot this down. Church is not... A building you go to. Okay? Bill, uh, Billy Sunday, a famous uh, preacher, had a, had a line that he would say on a regular basis, and, and it goes like this. Going to church does not make you a Christian any more than going to a garage makes you an automobile. Is that true or what? Right? The church is not a, a physical building. It's a spiritual building. Building. We're going to unpack that a little bit more as we go. But have you, we often say things like, today is the day we go to church. Now, is that biblically accurate? Not, not really. Think about it this way. Maybe we can say a little bit more accurately, today is the day the church gathers at our building. Okay, that's a little bit more accurate of a thing to say. The second thought I would present to you is this. Church is not a denomination that you join. Church is not a denomination 
that you join. And we have to always remind ourselves that not all Christians are in any one denomination, right? And not everyone, let me tell you this, not everyone who is in a denomination is a Christian. Now think about this as we're talking about what the church is and what it's not. The next thing is this, the church is not social activities that we participate in. <clears throat> unless the church, unless we see the church as something very different and very distinct from church activities, because we can participate in a lot of things around here. We can do socials, campouts, sing-alongs, movie nights, life group. Like, we can do all of this kind of stuff without ever having fulfilled the true purpose of the church in our lives. So it's not social activities. Okay, so what, what, what is it? What is the church according to the Bible? Are you ready for this? I'm going to teach you a little bit of Greek this morning, okay? Um, the word church comes from the Greek word ekklesia. Ekklesia. Jot that down if you're taking notes. It simply means this, the called out ones or the called out people. A congregation of people called out of the darkness and into God's light. And God's light is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what ecclesia is all about. This is what the church is. So it's not a building. It's a people. Right? It's not social events. It's not a denomination. No, it is a, a called out people of God. Okay, Ecclesia. Let's go now to uh, Ephesians chapter 2 as Paul is going to unpack this a little bit more and explain to us a little bit deeper about what the church and who the church really is. Okay, so Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to pick it up in verse 17. And I'm reading out of the NIV version. It says this, Jesus came and preached peace to you who were far away. We talked about that a lot last week. Who were far away and peace to those who were near. So he's saying he preached peace to the Jews and to the Gentiles. For through him, we both, we both, both groups, all people now, all people have, look at this, access to the Father. All people now in Christ have access to to the Father because of the blood of Jesus, which we focused on last week. But it says, access to the Father by one Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul goes on in these next few verses, and these next few verses, verses 19 through 22, is what I really want us to focus on today. And we see Paul explains what we have become as a result of having this peace with God. Okay, so in verse 19, he says this, consequently, all right, underline, circle that word, consequently, because now we have peace with God, because now we've been chosen and saved and rescued by God, this is, this is what it's going to say, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, comma, but now you are fellow citizens with God's people, underline that word, citizens, you are fellow citizens with God's people and also members. Underline that word members. Circle it. Something. Of his household. Look at this. Built. Underline that word built. On the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. With Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Now he's going to explain this a little bit more. He's going to explain this, this building process. In him... In Christ, or there's Paul's favorite phrase, right? He wants the Christians to know, hey, you are in Christ. This is your identity now. You're not in the world anymore. You're not this or that. No, you, your identity, who you are now is in him, in Christ. The whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Wow, what a picture. Paul uses just wonderful uh, uh, metaphors and, and words to describe the church now. Because think about it. God 
in his great love for us, does this marvelous work in us as individuals, right? He's chosen us before the foundations of the world. He's adopted us into his family. He has rescued us. He's included us. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And now he, he puts us in this new kind of spiritual community call, call, uh, of, of called out people called the church. And what Paul does in these, next, in, in these verses, he uses these, these three pictures or three metaphors of what the church of Jesus Christ actually is. So number one, if you're taking notes with me, jot this down. Uh, the first thing is we are citizens of God's kingdom. We're citizens of God's kingdom. The status of everyone, every single person in Christ is the same. There's no first or second class citizens in God's kingdom we all have equal citizenship. We all have equal value. We all have equal importance. And that doesn't mean that the church is without leaders. No, it just means that no one is more important than anyone else. We're all, we're all equally important in the body of Christ and as citizens of his kingdom. So what in the world does it mean that we're, that we're citizens? We're citizens of a kingdom. It means that we have all the rights, we have all the privileges, we have all the responsibilities uh, of the country to which you belong. That's what citizenship means, okay? You have all the rights and privileges of the country in which you belong. And one thing, I don't know if you've had a chance to travel internationally very much, but if you, if you do get a chance, you learn, you learn the value and the importance of this little book called your passport, right? Uh, anybody have a passport? Okay. All right. So as you, as you enter and you leave a country, you need to be able to show that passport, right? Or you're not going to get very far. Uh, or the passport is the tangible proof of your citizenship in a particular country. And so think about this because our citizenship... Where we call home, our homeland, plays a role in shaping who we are. It plays a role in understanding our personal identity. It plays a role, our citizenship plays a role in what we value, what we place as important, and how we live our lives. So all of us, if you are in Christ today, you are a citizen of God's kingdom. And that reality should shape the way you think. It should shape your understanding of who you are as an individual. And so how, how in the world do you become a citizen of God's kingdom? One of the most important questions, and, and, and I'm so glad you asked this question. Okay, thank you for asking. How do you become a citizen of God's kingdom? Look at this. I put this up on the screen. Up on the screen. This is really important. Citizenship in God's kingdom is only possible by being born into God's kingdom. Think about, think about that. This is what the Bible talks about in John chapter 3. I want you to just look at this in John chapter 3, because Jesus was talking to a Pharisee named Nicodemus. Has a very interesting conversation here. Let's look at it together. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher who is from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, look at this, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Jesus is saying you can't even see the kingdom of God. You can't even see how desirable, how beautiful, how wonderful, how powerful and, and just ma ma majestic this kingdom is. You can't even see this kingdom of God unless you've been born again. It says this, how can, how can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. He was confused. He didn't understand. He didn't get it. 
And so he asked this question. So Nicodemus and, 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 and Nicodemus went on to say, Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Makes sense. But Nicodemus is thinking very logically, very earthly. But Jesus answered and said, listen to this church. He said, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water, which means naturally on, on, on this earth, unless they are born of water and of the spirit. There's a spiritual birthing. That Jesus is talking about here. It's the way to see the kingdom. It's the way to enter and become a citizen in God's kingdom. He goes on to say, flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, listen, you must be born again. Church, friends, you must be born again if you really want to know what the kingdom of God is is all about. If you want to be a citizen in God's kingdom, listen to me, you must be born again. Amen? Amen. Amen. Number two is this. Uh, Paul describes the church as members of God's family. Jot that down if you're taking notes with me. Members of God's family. There's an old uh, Roman story which tells... um, how uh, one of their emperors was celebrating a big triumph. And he was, he was leading his victorious troops through the streets of Rome. And everyone was cheering, and there was great victory and triumph. The streets were crowded with people. And at a certain point on this parade route, uh, there, had been, there was a platform that had been built uh, from which the empress and the emperor's family might see this scene. And the route was lined with these great, tall, buff-looking Roman soldier guys, fully armed. And when the procession was coming near to the platform where the empress and the children were, the emperor's little son jumped down off the platform, burrowed his way through the crowd, and was just about to run on the road and intercept his father's imperial chariot. One of the soldiers who were there, was li- who was lining the road, picked him up and held him. And he said, no, child, you cannot go there. Uh, you, don't, you don't know who that is who is about to ride by. It's someone who is really important. That's the emperor. You can't just run out to him. And the little, the little kid laughed at this burly soldier. And he said, he may be your emperor but he's my father. <laughs> as a Christian, hear me guys, as a Christian, you are a member of God's family. You have any time, anywhere access to your heavenly father. In addition, as if that wasn't enough, as a member of God's family, you also have a bunch of new brothers. And a bunch of new sisters. You may look around and see some of them this morning. You are a member, whether you like them or not, you are a member of God's family. Look at what it says in John chapter 1, verse 12. This is so awesome. It says, He gave the right and the power to become children of God to those who received Him. This is Jesus talking. He says, he gave this to those who put their trust in Jesus' name, in his name. Number number three picture of the church is this. We are stones in, I didn't say we were stoned, okay? No, we are stones in God's temple, all right? We are stones in God's temple, We know that the church is not a building of bricks and mortar. But Paul likens the church to something of a spiritual building that's being being built. Everybody say built. The church is a spiritual building that's, that's being built into a holy temple. This is what it says in the scripture. Where God lives, 
by his spirit. Look at it again in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 and 22. It says, says this. I just want you to see these words. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. With Christ Jesus himself as a chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is, look, it's joined together. And it rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, in Christ, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Isn't that a beautiful picture of what God is doing as he is building the church? In other words, with the church, Jesus has this, this kind of spiritual construction project going on. Okay, Here's a quick, few quick observations that I just thought about reading this text this week. This, this uh, building that he's building is very well-founded. It is very well founded. Any builder that you talk to will tell you that the foundation of, the, of a structure is the most important part. Everything that is built up, up above that, it rests on the foundation. It's extremely important, the foundation of a building. And the scripture says that apostles and prophets are the foundation because of their, te- their teaching was based upon the person of of Jesus Christ. And it says this the cornerstone was was the most foundational stone in the whole building because everything was measured according to it. It gave stability and it gave direction to the entire building. The chief cornerstone is Jesus Christ himself for the church. Another observation is this. The church is a living building. It's, a, it's alive. The church is a living spiritual building, not a physical one. Each believer is called a stone in God's spiritual temple. Look at what it says in, uh, over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. It says this. You yourselves are being built like living stones... Into a spiritual temple. You are being made into a holy priesthood to offer up, a, offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We are living stones being built together as the Lord raises, raises up this building into a holy temple where God abides, where God dwells by His Spirit. So not only is it a a well-founded building, a living living building, it's also a growing building. Have you ever seen, uh, ever heard of a building that grows? Well, this building called the church, it's growing. It it rises. Look again at Ephesians 2 over in verse uh, 21. It says, in him the whole building is joined together and rises or grows to become a holy temple in the Lord. It is a living, growing building. And when you consider how the church began, you consider the people, the the motley band of followers who were mostly uneducated fishermen. You consider how the church started. It's amazing the growth. And how it has spread magnificently across the world because of the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. So not only is it a growing, rising building, it's a united building. Remember, remember, we're talking about the church. It's a united building. Over in Ephesians 2 again, it says, In him the whole building is joined together. And in him, you two are being built together. Let me, let me just tell you this. Unity in a church is so important. It's so important that we're on the same page. And, and to be honest with you, there are many different local churches in this city, in this nation, in this world. But there is only one 
universal church. So we ask the question, how many churches are there in Las Vegas? One. There is, there is one. As Christians, whether we like it or not, guess what? We're related to each other. We are family. We are one. Whether you're black, white, brown, purple, you have tattoos, no tattoos, crazy hair or not, it doesn't matter. Whether you come from a Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, the, the issue is, is this. Are you related to Christ? And are you in Christ Jesus? If that answer is yes, you are united as a member of God's family to all believers in the world. Not only is it a united building, it's a spirit-filled building. I want you to think about this. It's a dwelling in which God lives By His Spirit. By His Spirit. God lives in us as His people. He lives in us individually. And He lives in us and among us as a community. The Bible explains that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if we are to be an effective church, please hear me. For just a, just a second. If you zoned out, just zone right back in for just a second, okay? If we are to be an effective, life-giving church, we must have the power of the Holy Spirit operating mightily in our midst. We must be a people who are spirit-led. We must be a church that is spirit-filled. We don't need to be scared of it. We need to embrace it and desire it. We need to be a church that is Holy Spirit-empowered in everything that we've got going on here. If we really want to be an effective church, we've got to be sensitive and open to the power of And sometimes it's scary power of the Holy Spirit. But as a community, we need to embrace Him. We need to embrace the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We need to embrace all the gifts of the Spirit, even the ones that are controversial. Hello? They're all gifts from a good God. So... Just to recap real quick what we've talked about. So what is the church, really? The Bible uses that word, ecclesia. It means the called out people of God. We are citizens of God's kingdom. We are members of the family of God. And we are the living stones in God's temple. So we have to ask the question, so what? Right? Right? Okay, pastor, I understand this is what the Bible says about the church, but what does that have to do with me? How can that benefit me in some area of my life? Well, let me give you five. I'm so glad you asked that, by the way. But let me give you five simple thoughts, and and each thought is tied to a practical application step for you to pray about and think about today. Think about this. Number one, a church helps me center my life around God. Center my life around God. The Bible calls this worship. Worship is not just a a few minutes on a Sunday morning, right? No. The action step here is, hey, put God first in every area of your life. In your marriage, put Him first. In your relationships, put Him first. In your finances, put Him first. Put God first in every area area of your life when you wake up when you go to bed how you raise your kids is he first in every area of your life number two is this a church helps me to connect with other believers the bible calls this fellowship My 
My action step may be today to join a life group. Somebody likes that. It's because somebody knows the power of that. It's transformational. It can absolutely change your life. When you get into a small group of people where you can look people in the eye and say, hey, I'm struggling with this. Can you help me through this? Hey, I've got a question about this. Can we study the Bible together? Can you pray with me about this? Hey, I had an accident the other day, and I need some help. Can you cook some, can you cook some meals for me? Can you send some people to help, help me and to my family? This kind of ministry is so important, and this kind of ministry takes place when you're in a life group. And everybody in a life group said a big amen to that. Okay. The next one is this. A, a church helps me to cultivate spiritual maturity. Anybody want to grow in their spiritual maturity? Okay. The Bible calls this discipleship. A great place to start that is to attend their growth track. But beyond that... Do you have relationships? Are you serious about studying the Bible? Are you serious about your prayer life? Do you have those relationships where people are discipling you? And are you, in turn, discipling other people? This is what discipleship is all about. And as I said, the great place to start that process, attend the growth track. The next thing is this. A church helps me to give something back. The Bible calls this my ministry. And maybe your action step today is, hey, I want to get plugged in here and I want to join that dream team. Our dream team is just what we call our, all of our volunteers around here. Maybe that's your action step today, to give something back. God calls us not to just be consumers, but contributors. Amen? The last thing is this. A church helps me to share God's message. Communicate God's message. To testify, to tell others about the greatness of Jesus Christ. The Bible calls this my mission. And my action, my action step, your action step today may be to tell other people about Jesus. Just to testify about what Jesus Christ has done in your life. Maybe to use that in, invi invite card that Z showed you guys a, a minute ago. Take that card, take a bunch of cards, and just love on people, invest in people, let people know you care about them, earn the right to speak to them, and you know what? Invite them. Invite them to Jesus. Invite them to church. Invite them into your life. I just always tell people, invest and invite. And then guess what? Once they come, or once they come to Jesus, don't quit investing in them. Keep investing. Invest, invite, and invest some more. This is part of what it means to be on mission for God. Now, <clears throat> at this time, I want to ask uh, John Hosey to come on up. John sent me a text yesterday. Reminded me that he's getting out of uh, rehab. He went home yesterday. <clears throat> As you know, John's been through a lot in his life. And he said, hey, Pastor B, can I take a few minutes and just to share what God has been doing in my life and to tell the church a few things from my heart. And I want you to hear this as, a, as an extension of the message about the church and the benefits of the church family. I want you to hear it in that, in that context this morning. Okay? Go ahead, John. It's all yours. Okay. Thank you. Um, for those that don't know, three weeks ago, yesterday, I was involved in a helicopter crash in uh, Texas. Um, um, according to the FAA, it's a three and six million or 66 million, I don't know, I lost track, percent chance to survive a helicopter crash. Myself, one of my brothers, and the pilot and co-pilot 
kind of mostly walked away from it. Um, I got a bunch of injuries, but that's okay. Um, this church stepped up to the plate when uh, the accident happened. I, I first, when it happened, for the first time in my life, I actually stopped and prayed as the helicopter was pinned on my legs and prayed and said, God, get me out of this. Keep me and Nick safe. Whatever happens, happens. And, and we'll go from there and, and keep us safe. A few minutes later, after Nick got unhooked and, and whatnot, we were sitting there. I, I prayed to him again and said, please help me so Sarah doesn't kill me when I make the phone call. <laughs> that we're back at this again. Um, six years ago, I got hit with an improvised explosive device in Afghanistan. So we've been through the rehab process before. Now we're back at it again. Um, so once we got to the hospital and whatnot, and I was able to FaceTime Sarah and call her and whatnot, my next call was immediately to Pastor B and said, can you help me please? Can you send Ashley over to the house to help Sarah? because she's not taking it well and I'm in fear of my life when she gets here. <laughs> to, to, <laughs> I know there's, there's good distance between us though. Um, <laughs> to make sure that she was safe and she was gonna be, be good and, and that she didn't get that doubt in her mind because as we all know, when tragedy hits, that's when the devil comes at us. Um, for the first time last Sunday, Pastor B came in to give me communion. And Nick has been in this building one other time when I gave my testimony the day after Thanksgiving. He actually came across the hall and took communion and has been learning for the last three weeks when I kind of, when he was like, what are you doing? Well, we were, he was standing above me and I was still strapped underneath the helicopter. Um, he's like, what are you doing? And I was like, well, I was praying. And he's like, well, let's talk about this pray thing because I've met him twice, but I don't really know him. So literally as I'm pinned underneath the helicopter, we're having this talk. Mind you, it was to keep us both talking and, and keep us go both going. But even after that, he's learned. Um, and then the last three weeks, people have called and sent messages while I was in the, back here in Vegas in the rehab facility, learning to start all this stuff over again um, and whatnot. But Tracy stepped up and started a, a, a meal track. So people have been bringing us meals. It started yesterday because we escaped from the hospital yesterday. I don't know if you follow me on Facebook. I, I tried to get my little brother who's a Metro officer to get a couple cars behind us with lights and sirens to add to it, but it didn't work to say that we escaped from the rehab hospital because it kind of felt that way. But this church is part of my family. It is my family. It's my family's family. Where the girls, Sarah was able to come and the girls were taken care of. <laughs> That's hard, I got six broken ribs. It's. <laughs> It's hard, it's hard to keep it in. Um, but there was no thought of, are the girls gonna be taken care of anything? Because we knew that all of their aunts and uncles were gonna take care of them. And the house was still standing when Sarah got home. So we know people were checking on them and they were good. But join a growth group because that growth group will help you not just learn about Jesus, not just learn about the church, but it'll help you in all aspects of your life. Stuff that you never thought it would help you with, it's helped us with to conversations that we've had with even Tyler and we've helped with Madison and, and whatnot. You never expect that that's, that, that just a growth group, a couple of hours, you know, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday, or whatever day the growth group you go to, how it can impact and change your life. But it will change your life in ways you never expected. And even coming to church on Sundays, it will impact your life. And if you need babysitters, they're here for you to help. 
I, I can even babysit as long as they're not really mobile, you know, it, it helps. But this church is a family and we need to keep growing that family. You know, like Z said, pass those cards out to everybody. I had nurses coming and asking, hey, what are you doing? Because I was bored. So I was between Maury Povich and Jerry Springer and those shows, <laughs> which daytime television is really interesting if you've never watched it before. And reading my iPad and reading the Bible and learning new things and teaching Nick new stuff, the stuff is there. It's all written. It's all in the Bible for us to teach each other. And all you have to do is open it up and read it. In this day and age, you don't even have to open it up. It's on an iPad, and it's right there in front of you, and you can just read it and pass it on. And for three weeks straight, I have it set on my phone where I get a, a daily verse a day. And in all honesty, for the last three weeks, every day, that verse had something to do with what Nick and I were going through. So I just had to share that with you guys. Thank you for everything you guys do. And let's continue to grow the Springs. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Thank you, Lord. Let me go ahead and invite the, uh, our worship team back up. We're going to enter into just a time of prayer, as we usually do. But before we do, maybe you snuck in here today. Maybe, some, maybe you have a drug problem. You were drugged to church by your friend. <laughs> Or maybe you have a really drug problem and you need to be set free, right? Jesus Christ has the power to set you free. He has the power to save your, save your life, to rescue you, to save your soul, deliver you from whatever binds you, give you a place in heaven. Let's enter into a time of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are. Father, we thank you for your church. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word about your church. Thank you, Lord, for the benefits of being a part of a local family. We thank you that we have a family. We thank you, Lord, that we have anywhere, anytime access to you. We thank you, Lord, that we have support and love and encouragement from our brothers and sisters. We just thank you, Lord, for your church. And friends, if you're here today and you would say, hey, today is my day to confess the Lord Jesus as my Lord and as my Savior because I want to be a citizen of God's kingdom. I want to be a member of his family. I want to be one of those living stones in the building that he's building. I want to be saved. I want to be born again. If that's you here today, I just want to invite you to pray this simple prayer after me. Pray it from your heart. There's no magic in these words, but if you mean it from your heart, you confess it with your mouth. The Bible says that you will be saved. So I want to invite just everybody, everybody just pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I come to you today as sinner. I am, in, I am broken and in need of you. I confess all my sins to you. And I turn away from them now. I turn wholeheartedly to you. I believe, Jesus, that you laid down your life on the cross for me to pay for my sins, to save me in every way that a person can be saved, and to allow me the experience of being born again. Today, I believe in my heart 
that God raised Jesus up from the dead on that third day. I put my full trust in you, Jesus. All of my hope is now in you, Jesus. I confess you as my Lord and as my Savior. Now please fill me with your Holy Spirit and empower me to live the rest of my life for you. And thank you for putting me in a church family. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Church, if you prayed that prayer, let me encourage you to take those next steps. Think about the next steps that God has for you. Join the growth track. Get water baptized. Make church attendance a priority for your life, a non-negotiable. Join the dream team. What is it that God's speaking to you? Take that next step. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for courage today. Lord, that we would have the strength, the bravery, the ability to put into practice those things that we learned today to hear your voice clearly in our hearts and to receive your empowerment to take the next step. I pray that for my brothers and my sisters. It's in Jesus' name. And we all said amen. Come on, church. And we all said amen. amen.